people have more rights than us to expect. So, what do we expect from our anesthetist? As I gather, friends, I think Dr. Tarun Vagela uh, asked us to elaborate on what do we expect from our anesthetist. I have to ask him only one thing. So what does he really mean by we? What do we expect from our anesthetist? What did you think, Dr. Vagela? What does really we mean? Who all are we? Only obstetricians? Please explain. Please elaborate. It is, it is bilateral. It is, it is, it is bilateral. Hello. Yeah. It's we means total obstetric society and obstetric hospitals, not only obstetrician. Whole of the hospital is expecting from anesthetists. And it is vice versa also, but somehow that only one heading was there, we expect from the anesthetists. It is a reversal also, okay, what we expect, anesthetiologists expect from gynecologists or any surgical hospitals. Yeah, so I thought about it, and I thought that we meant the obstetrician, the neonatologist, the OT staff, patients herself, and even patients' relatives. So, an anesthetist should be responsible for all these people, responsible to all these people, and not just the obstetrician. Yes. Isn't it? Right. So, now I take a little bit of opportunity to go back into the history. And I want to ask you one thing. Can you see this lovely photograph? It's a very old photograph. As it is written down below, it is James Young Simpson. Can you tell me why this photograph is put up? Anyone? January 19, 1847 began the history of optic analgesia. He was the first person to administer ether in a lady with deformed pelvis with rickets and as a professor of midwifery in Edinburgh, he felt that this lady needed uh, some analgesia during delivery, otherwise she would have been died, she would have been dead. You're so, so right. He started working in 1847 and he was the first person to use ether. But he didn't even stop there. Not only he used ether, but after a time he started using chloroform. But uh, Gajja said, does the history end there? No. no. It is a long sequence of the history. And if you look at the history 160 years back, but in last few years, say 70 years, there are lots of changes. Formerly, we were happy with nitrous oxide. Then came the neuraxial anesthesia. Then some concept of twilight sleep. Then spinal anesthesia became popular with the advent of procaine. Then Aburel described the pain pathways of labor. Then again concept of lumbar epidural approach and lidocaine in 1950. But after that, or just before that, people were practicing IV barbiturates. But it was a Mendelssohn in 1946 who first thought of this Mendelssohn syndrome. Aspiration, pneumonia. In 1960, supine hypotensive syndrome and 24 hour epidural services. That concept came in 1960. And from 1980, obstetric anesthetists have assured key roles in management of labor, especially preeclampsia, eclampsia, major hemorrhage, and perioperative care. So it is some sort of symbiotic relationship which you told, sir, in the morning. Now, I need to ask Dr. Pandya two things. What is twilight sleep? None of us really know about what is twilight sleep. See, the thing is, we all know that uh, the pain or laboring uh, process is a very painful process. It's like breaking 56 bones and the fracture pain that you get after breaking 56 bones, the amount of pain that a parchment experience during that short journey of 12 to 14 hours of the journey of life we call the most difficult journey of a human man from the womb to the outside world. Uh, and as a part of pain methodology, yes, ether was the first agent to be used, 
followed by nitrous oxide, followed by chloroform, so on and so forth. But many a times, uh, they started using morphine, a combination of morphine, hyoscine in 1940s, late 40s and early 50s. And that's what the term of twilight sleep where the patient is half asleep, half awake and that somnolent phase. And uh, they soon realized that this twilight sleep with a combination of morphine and hyoscine was the one that produced depressed neonate and newborns. And it came and it vanished also. And only the petrin was subsequently used for, uh, till uh, it's still being used. But twilight sleep was there for about a few years. But they realized that this twilight sleep, not only it caused a little bit of uh, pain relief, but at the same time it produced depressed neonates. So I need it, to come here once. Uh, my mother, who was also a gynecologist and obstetrician, and uh, she was trained uh, to be an obstetrician in 40s and 50s. So what she used to do, and I as a young child saw, was a thin little bottle was strapped around a woman's hand, right hand. As soon as she would start having labor pain, she would put that bottle of trilene on her face, take a couple of deep breaths, then she would fall asleep, will not feel pain, and with that sleep, the bottle would fall off. Once again, she would wake up, next pain, once again, she'll lie. I think that was the real twilight sleep in practical purpose. Am I right? Probably, yes, that also. That was the international twilight, but this was parental twilight. Yeah. Hyacin and uh, morphine, yes. Right. The next question, I think Dr. Uh, Gajar said that from 1980s, the role of anesthesiologist in obstetric practice is widened. Can you elaborate what is the real role of an obstetrician, or of an anesthetist in obstetric practice? How many of you read uh, Why Mothers Die Trinal Audit in UK? Or have you come across such an audit, maternal uh, mortality audit? If you read Why Mothers Die Audit of 1980s, the cause of maternal death, like if you look at the causes of maternal death because of various things, Hemorrhage, hypertension have been predominantly the leading cause. Uh, but importantly, of the mothers who had hypertensive emergencies, the commonest cause, of course, of maternal death because of hypertensive emergencies was intracerebral events like uh, IC bleed and subarachnoid bleeds. But most importantly, pulmonary edema was the cause of death. And from 80 onwards, that was a landmark study when the anesthetist entered the labor room in 1980s as a part of symbiotic relationship, on-site presence, the, the death because of pulmonary edema was zero. And from 1980 onwards, the death of maternal death because of pulmonary edema in UK has been zero. And that is because of the involvement of anesthesiologist early in uh, the childbirth care. Once again, it is an excellent elaboration. But what happened in 2023? Look at the last paragraph. The obstetric anesthetist should undertake education of medical and midwifery staff in the early recognition, monitoring, and treatment of the sick mother, resuscitation training, running skill drills for emergency simulations, risk management, and above all, audit of maternal mortality on the labor ward. And that's what you, Dr. Vagela, Dr. Chowda, and everybody else is doing. Thank you all anesthetists. So, so as suggested by Dr. Bharat Nair, we as an obstetrician attend every delivery. Nowadays we keep neonatologists also with us in the team. So what do you think Dr. Vagala, should we call anesthetist in each and every labor? Yeah, each and every labor is, uh, nowadays it is possible. Nowadays, which is possible, previously, because of scarcity of anesthetists, uh, there will be a crisis of the anesthetists. Now, these freely available anesthetists are very uh, <laughs> high in range. <laughs> so, uh, and as far as uh, you give very handsome remuneration, uh, then every anesthetist will come. But at least you will, you will cut short it to the management of high risk pregnancies. Okay. In, in, yeah, in every short. patient we will come. Ah, because yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I'll give you a mic. So, uh, in, that, in that case, we can have every labor under uh, epidural. Then uh, you can have uh, service of anesthetist and uh, you don't have to uh, uh, 
say that uh, anesthetist Doctor just sir. came and go and Satyar. didn't uh, have not every labor thing. epidural Every labor yeah, epidural is, every labor epidural is or a every labor or anesthetist. No, no. Basically he is a he is a bombman, but he speaks like a vanya. <laughs> so he wants money in each and every labor now. <laughs> but I do you think, agree that every also. labor in every labor I it should be epidural? No, 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 okay, no never, fine. never. But in every labor there should be anesthetist? Yes. yes or no? Yes. yes. Maybe maybe yes. right because well in advance or region when needed. Four no, minutes, no, five no, four minutes. I, I think for an individual nursing home practice. That is not practical. But for a corporate hospital, that is going to be possible when there are six or eight anesthetists and one anesthetist is designated labor floor duty. And that sir. is then possible. Sir, 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 sir. May, may I may ah. add a, again? Uh, I think there is a scope, very big scope for uh, obstetricians to improve on their practice and make an impact in the society that they are doing a high-end work by providing their uh, patients and painless labor. I think do, do first obstruction is staff and obstetricians in providing Ar the... Archana, do you agree all patients should undergo epidural? And every time we explain I, I, to patient but not everyone ready for that. Okay. That, that, is okay. that is okay. That is okay. So, that is okay. But but uh, there are so many other ways. I think this discussion only epidural is not. Can be done. This, this can be done. There is an obstruct, uh, uh, obstruction from the first level that. Na ato nahi thay. A painless to nahi thay. Ama ama painless nahi thay. But now I think there should be open mind. I, th I think I think that. The epidural analgesia is not indicated all the normal delivery. She has she has changed the party. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, is yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, let me tell you something. But does the presence of an anesthesiologist on the labor ward guarantee you of avoiding all complications? Will they recognize all signs, all symptoms of an obstetric problem, obstetric anesthesiology problem? There is very little evidence to guide us in the anesthetic management of a critically ill obstetric patient. Most recommendations today that we have are derived from non-obstetric patients. And we really do not have today a stratum by which we can find out that this obstetric patient is either ill or going to be ill. Isn't it so? So, do we have the need to have an special OB resuscitative format? Do we have the need of a special OB ICU or SDU? The thing is, the concept of obstetric practice, one thing is, if you look at the data or the review of data by Stephen Gatt or any of those, uh, or even our own experience uh, and papers, two-thirds of obstetric ICU admissions that happen, they are normal at conception. That means 70 percent of mothers who come to ICU are unpredictable. Okay. Absolutely. They deteriorate either during antipartum period or interpartum period or immediate postpartum period. Highly unpredictable. So having an anesthesiologist, as you said, labor ward duty or anything definitely helps because what the mother needs initially is ABCs, effective ABCs. And as an anesthesiologist, day in and day out, our job is ABCs and CABs. Uh, and uh, we are expert in doing those things. So I would say if you are practicing obstetrics in a remote setup or in a suboptimal setup, then better to have extra pair of hands because when the patient is going to bleed, when the patient is going to land up in problem, uh, an experienced anesthetist, probably Dr. Gujar and Dr. Kapadia have the problem. Uh, it doesn't mean the others will have problem, but uh, it, if somebody is just a phone call away or in-house presence, it makes sometimes makes an impact. In our hospital, we are 24 into 7, so uh, the moment they are there, we just go there in one minute time, less than a minute's time, and uh, we are there. And believe me, this situation of on-call, on-delivery help happens at least seven to eight times every week. Because so, the volumes are large in our hospital. So, but uh, having an anesthetist 
resuscitation efforts can be prompt. And as I said, 1980s, risk of maternal death because of pulmonary has been zero since 1980s in the United Kingdom. Just because of the presence of anesthetists and early ABCs, NIVs, intubations, whatever it is. So, Sir. and coming to Chintan's uh, question whether epidural is necessary for all cases, see, there's a choice of mother. Okay. And, but, but only thing from our side, I can say that epidural is very safe and we should, as a clinician, we should not discourage if somebody is wanting it or somebody is requesting it. Sir, actu actually, as an, uh, our colleagues also in anesthesia also, they, they are discouraging that epidurals are not that standard or all that. Actually, epidurals are the one of the very easy and skilled Dr. Dr. things. And I just, you can do it. No, I just want easily. to add one thing. And we, we it don't, can uh, be in obstetrics, it is worth to. Uh, yes, we don't, we don't disagree with your statement uh, that uh, it, is ad, it is having advantages. So, the problem is that. If you give epidural, you stay with the patient till the patient delivers. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Basically, yeah, yeah. problem is that we because can, you are. We can. That, that's what, uh, that's I, what I, I, was, I was stressing. That if, if I would you like to. I would like to. Come to that, in a day, Dr. Chintan. I, I got a work of three deliveries. I will stay with. Dr. Chintan, so, I would like to come to the no, no, more important. I would like to come to the more important topic, and that is there are some physiological changes in the pregnancy. And there are some pathological things. Now, most of our anesthetists, they are used to work in IC unit, do the principles of routine non obstetric patient differ from management of obstetric ICU case. Please give some guideline. Absolutely. As I said, yeah. the maternal physiology and fetal physiology, they differ. And as a clinician, we need to be aware of both the parallel physiologies to give the best to the patient. Yes, we know that uh, unless you know the impact of physiological change in pregnancy. Like if I may ask, uh, what is the normal PaCO2 in a pregnant patient, madam? Normal arterial carbon dioxide tension in a ABG. In ABG. In a pregnant patient. Or a normal bicarbonate level in a pregnant patient. Or what happens to the minute ventilation in pregnancy? Or what happens in, since what uh, period of gestation the cardiac output starts increasing? So that is so, the thing I am coming to. There are some differences in the resuscitation, hydration, so doses this, of antibiotics. Uh, there are some differences while calculating the IV fluid levels and there are some physiological changes which occur in the form of hemodilution, change in the position of the heart, respiratory system, even respiration, abdominal thoracic, so many things, PCO2 and everything is changed. So, modern obstetrician and anesthetist has to be conversant it, with it, this It's change. not that anesthetist only should know, even obstetrician, like suppose if you are yeah. interpreting a blood gas analysis, which I was, I was emphasizing, if you don't know the normal values, uh, like uh, even I would say I can utter then Dr. Ram Raj a very, very renowned critical care specialist from uh, uh, Chennai. Uh, he gave a talk in Hyderabad on uh, ABG in pregnancy. I, I, in fact, I invited him for, but everything he spoke was very excellent talk, but the values that he projected on the screen were non-pregnant patients. So, so, awareness about what happens in pregnancy is very important to give targeted resuscitation. We know the maternal reserve is high. They don't have the classical signs of hypovolemia early. At the same time, maternal reserve is very poor. The moment they have one insult, they decompensate very rapidly. So I think I should summarize this. In summary, I think obstetric anesthesia is a subspecialty by itself. We started the fellowship course in 2007, sir. Good. <laughs> ah, that is good. Right. Now, the next question goes to Dr. Chintan Vyas and Dr. Kantibai. What is PAC? Do you practice PAC routinely? Yes, it should be. Uh, we are doing it. In OB uh, patients? Uh, yes, I, I think uh, every now and then you see the medical legal issues. They have, uh, the judge has uh, delivered the judgment that PAC is not done. So you are a negligent on first uh, instance. So I think it is a hard time uh, uh, requirement of the day that we should do uh, PSE of every patient and obstetric 
always a so in anc visit that should be in a plan one, uh, in a plan uh, case so for the plan case and I, I is it possible uh, is it really possible to do it, it is it is in possible we, emergencies you can you can run a psc clinic i have i i have I started i am talking about obstetric emergencies in obstetric emergencies also is it possible to do psc yes uh, psc is what uh, any anesthesia psc actually a pre anesthetic checkup so uh, if you are going any uh, uh, giving any anesthetic drug you uh, assess beforehand that is psc you can do uh, on table on uh, uh, oper operating table or on uh, labor table uh, uh, assessment that 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 can be ca Achana called as a psc See, i'll just uh, uh, why not fine but if you find something abnormal, abnormal you will yeah, yes yes uh, then we can recommend the uh, required test then we can discuss with the obstetrician that this can be modality if, if uh, so, so so one more thing yeah uh, if there is a routine patient who will probably require probably go to a, a c section for say diabetes yeah. in pregnancy yeah. when do you call her to your clinic for puc psc i think as soon as, as soon as uh, uh, patient is in a, Six seven month. Uh, you uh, people I know it better. No no no. I will put it other way. Archana Ben, you, you are should, going to do cesarean section of a patient. You should send. For you are PSC, calling anesthetist for preoperative examination. <coughs> at what stage of pregnancy? At what duration of pregnancy? You know that she is for a classical she is for a elective cesarean section. At what stage of pregnancy you will call an anesthetist to examine? After thirty two weeks. Yes, probably last few weeks, last few weeks. because till last few weeks the physiology keeps on changing. changing. Even if you have seen it, seen her at say 20 I, weeks, I think, I you think will sir, probably have to sir, see sir, her sir, again. Sir. I think you, you are sending patients for uh, USC every three, uh, oh, uh, three yeah. times, three times minimum. That is a protocol I think. Huh? So why can't you send the patient twice to Anesthetist. <laughs> no, it is not. I think that See, is a chance. It is not the question of twice or thrice. Okay. Why not? <laughs> so here Why is a here he, here is a man <laughs> who really wants PSC frequently. But I'll tell does you his one. PSC responsibility end there? Absolutely not. Or do you Absolutely want something not. more for him? It is an assessment. We can find out for the betterment of patient that uh, there is any problem, and See. we can. Correct or if you, suggest. If you look at from the physiologic and viewpoint. And also plan. From the physiologic viewpoint. In fact, ours is a high risk unit and we are 24 into 7. So we are involved, we have something known as OpsMed team, like obstetric medical team, when we have a physician, you have an anesthetician, obstetrician together, and we do a joint clinic or complex cases. But routine cases also, they come to us uh, before conception or uh, at 16 weeks, at 32 weeks, as Madam said and again uh, before delivery. The idea is, if you look at the impact of the cardiovascular or physiologic changes, the first peak of cardiovascular changes happens around 16 weeks, when the quickening happens. And if the mother is having pre-existing severe cardiac disease, they become symptomatic at around 16 weeks, four, four months of pregnancy gestation. And if you happen to see her around that period, you will not treat as a simple viral infection, as a wheezing, you think beyond wheezing, it could be cardiac cause or something, whatever it is. And you may subject the patient for you. And once you diagnose, and probably you get a best window after 22 weeks to 30 weeks of any intervention, if at all you need any. Uh, so that is when you do first PAC as at an institute level. And second PAC around 32 weeks, but that is when the second peak of cardiac output occurs. So most of the women who have moderate uh, uh, to severe disease, who are asymptomatic, they become symptomatic during this phase. And that is the right. And still you have a window of about six to eight weeks for you to stabilize medically. The whole idea is to catch an underlying disorder and to optimize so that you can give appropriate therapy. Uh, I don't know the freelance practice, whether the patient comes to you, it becomes difficult. So probably what I feel is, as a protocol, if you can send all pregnant women around 32 weeks, uh, for a, you can have some dedicated PAC days uh, uh, around 30 to 33 weeks, you just see the patient, make your notes. But as Sir said rightly, does the duty or responsibility end at PAC? No, it does not end. It is the beginning. It is the beginning. And when you are doing PAC, it's just not uh, simply 
a counseling epidural blah blah it is just assessment the patient as a physician because internally and it's a general treatment physicians we are periodic physicians very part of physicians and assess the patient appropriately and as madam said the dynamic physiology keeps changing what you assess today may be different to tomorrow so again you need to assess so it doesn't mean that i have seen patient now in the city the same thing is going to persist malampati grade 1 we know that malampati changes every phase of uh, trimester every stage trimester during labor also so it has to be dynamic phases and responsibility of anesthesiologist is as a part of team so dr prince your anesthetist has done pse and he has said the saib karo bapu kai vaandho nahi everything is fine so does your responsibility end there My anesthetist has said, uh, at what weeks? At before operating or at uh, examined uh, her at 32 weeks? Uh, before operating, no? Yes. no he has done pre-anesthesia checkup. Before operating. He has done pre-anesthesia okay. checkup. Okay. He will certainly ask for some reports. Okay. Say ECG, ECO, mm -hmm. investigations, everything there. Okay, okay. And he has, uh, will you counsel a patient? in your presence with anesthetist or anesthetist will counsel that patient separately no no we do uh, at at our hospital we i counsel with anesthetist each and uh, recently only uh, we did counseling uh, in a short stretcher patient so it you counsel not, together uh, so counsel our responsibility is influence you or you are influenced by him no <laughs> <laughs> actually so we did a high risk counseling together doesn't end there team is working towards patient safety that is the bottom line is that what i feel that what we have been doing is we counsel ourselves we send her to his, uh, the anesthesiologist who is also on the same floor and then he has his opinion a written opinion we have my opinion and then we both of us sit together discuss the patient would absolutely. that be the right approach absolutely right so uh, the psc does not end the responsibility two heads are it better than one it has to be head. something to do with pre operative immediate immediate post operative yeah uh, during operation and as he rightly said what are the things that you require to sign out he has already elaborated that and i don't think i have to go in the details of this particular slide but the most important thing is the record keeping intra op record keeping is the most important thing in uh, today's day and age what was the pulse and blood pressure at the time of induction in the middle every of every 5 minutes every 1 minute that is that is the chart that is every drug that you offer to the patient and i want to also do one thing that whenever you fill a ampule please see, see to it that the person who breaks the ampule will show you the ampule will read out the name and will read out the expiry date of that particular molecule and that will really show the uh thing because otherwise he may bring in anything you give this injection and then it will be a uh, case over R rule of 3 is what we recommend what we follow the rule of 3 is when you want to pick up an ampule like say i want to give ephedrine i pick up i need ephedrine so i want to ephedrine is there registered in my mind i pick up ephedrine ampule and reconfirm that it is ephedrine ampule and while i am breaking the ampule or my technician is breaking the ampule he read out loud and when i'm loading it again i read out and before i discard i read and discard so three rule of 3 is almost safeguarding your uh, thing that right drug is administered right drug is loaded importantly right drug is loaded in a right labeled syringe many okay. a times you may load the right drug but in it may labeling may be wrong so medical errors and mishaps happen because of these things uh, i'll just tell you one instance when i was in uk as an observer uh one anesthetist uh, was there it was the elective cesarean section and she gave a combined spinal epidural and patient developed bradycardia and she gave atropine and uh, the consultant anesthetist and she asked the oda oda is the operating department is like an anesthesia technician uh, load one more atropine she said i have not loaded atropine no there was an atropine there she said i have given that that the drug which he loaded was oxytocin <laughs> and the anesthetist gave oxytocin five units for duck iv and then immediately she called the obstetrician and then they painted and draped and uh, they delivered nothing happened to the child but it was a critical incident and they had to write a 10 seven page report uh, why wrong drug was administered so even in the best of setup these things can happen 
if you look at the history of uh, what all has been given epidurally, right from chlorhexidine to halothane to magnesium to parental nutrition, have gone into epidural space. Uh, so you have to be very, very critical. OT is a very high risk prone areas, error prone areas, and you need to be aware that if you are fatigued, call your team member to do the case. You should not do because like, your senses like are not. Think uh, about theatre setup. You in your talk said something about warmers in the theatre, bottle warmers in the OT, OR area. Sorry, say it again, sir. In the warmers, OT, uh, bottle warmers. <laughs> I advocate a small little refrigerator. If you, have you seen car refrigerator smalls? Yes. The, if you keep that in the fridge, uh, that fridge in the OT area, your pitocins, your scolines, etc., can be very well kept there, and the temperatures can be maintained, and their potency can be and uh, preserved. Right. So Satyan, you are doing cesarean section. Vagela Sahib is giving and he has given anesthesia. You have closed uterus and in the middle of the surgery, he is getting another call uh, and he would, like, <laughs> he would like to take your leave. Because okay, I have uterus one, thank you, patients are there, pulse is there, and SPO2 is there, and we have to go to our house, and we have to go to our house. Satyan Sukh, you have to come to our house, and you Freelance mata ho kutu chalto joe sa varso thi. Basically, ideally, I should not Ideally, allow. speaking to kutu boh ideally hoi. Uh, ideally ne, but practically, ghani var ehu bijo saame fetal distance no call hoi. Ayaan pressure stable hoi. Ideally, you should not go leave the theatre. So, at what no. stage of surgery? There, there is nothing ideally, you should stay to the, with the patient. Uh -huh. Absolutely. There is Absolutely. no second thought. So, there is no debate. <laughs> if you, you have so, to see that your primary responsibility is the patient whom you have anesthetized now. Not that fetal distance which is happening. That is not your responsibility. So the primary responsibility is your patient whom you have anesthetized. Till the surgery is over, patient is stabilized for at least 15-30 minutes. Till then you cannot leave. So you will leave once abdomen is Sorry, closed. Sorry, Vakila <laughs> Satyan, <laughs> Satyan has you checked. You will leave to, after the you patient is time. You will allow See, time for the Satyan to see. Your is running away here. Then, huh? that is but if the, he runs away. Is there a PPH or patient is shifted to ward? Relatives are reassured. So who is there? Surgeon? And only the surgeon and the nurses. Nurses. The and patient then, on waking up sees only the surgeon and the nurses. Because if the patient deteriorates post-operatively, I mean the patient needs you, like suppose for whatever reason, your duty does not end at immediately at the end of surgery. Yes, you have to wait at least for till the physiology, post-surgical physiology, which takes about 30 minutes to, like if I'm giving a GA, at least 30 minutes is what I stay, of course we don't do freelance, but it's what we recommend till the patient is fully recovered and conscious and other things. Suppose if I have to leave for one more fetal distance, I put a person who can do ABCs effectively in my place and then leave. That is one more anesthetist who can be junior, whatever you don't do, and you need to put a team. <laughs> so you will leave once patient is shifted to the ward, settle. So if you are a solo, and huh, you can come. You so come. I have a solution to this, but how many anesthetists practice this solution? How many anesthesiologists today have anesthesia assistants or junior peers? Qualified, qualified. Qualified, of course. M How many anesthesiologists? Why don't they have? What are the practical uh, reasons for not having? Because I feel that during a surgical procedure, an anesthesia assistant will not only administer and monitor the anesthetic, he may adjust and maintain the level of anesthetic, and also assist in lab work, blood collection, and conducting a few tests. I think it's really required. I have my surgery assistant. Why can't an anesthesiologist one, have one, one an anesthesia that, assistant? Uh, one of the things that... Yes. See, Kapadia uh, uh, sir, one, one thing which we need to keep in mind is cognition of uh, the idea that uh, see, most of the anesthetists they do, do this running around. See, they don't have inner intention to leave the patient. 
end of the day money is important and commercial reasons they are leaving so you need to strike a balance that they are well compensated <laughs> i exactly or, said the same or thing <laughs> Well paid. I exactly said the same well thing. Paid. Well if paid I also. can afford an assistant in today's days and age, with today's charges, can't an anesthesiologist afford an assistant? Sir. Or uh, an anesthesia trained anesthesia nurse assistant? Sir. Sir, so do, I you want, have, do you have time to eat? I want to answer this question yeah. and previous question also. Okay. Now, I agree with Dr. Pandya sir and with you that anesthetist should be present till the very end, even he should be overseeing the patient while shifting, that is fine. And unfortunately, I am not preferred by many because I do that. I don't leave a patient, if I am engaged in a PPI patient, I don't go for the second hospital by the side for caesarean section even. And secondly, you have a valid point that you should have keep a qualified assistant. Both things are correct. The problem is the payment. <laughs> I am telling you, 30% that is the general rule. I am not into any, I am not charging anywhere 30%, but 30% of the operative charge. Do you think the anesthetic job is only 30% important of that of a surgeon? Oh. No. <laughs> Sir, it is no. In Western countries, I am telling you, in Western countries, the anesthetic charges are as equal to the surgeon charge. I, I should so intervene in this. Yeah, and, I keep on telling my, I mean, nobody agree with me. And, and you should, you should, nah, you should compensate, you should pay for the maintenance charge of hospital also. No, 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 no that, if, if yeah, I pay you that no, much no, no, money, the risk, I'm all the, the, the facilities, oh, no, 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 Dr. No, Satya, no, 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 the risk, it, it should no, be vice versa. See, see, what does an anesthetic use extra? What? Previous so, days we were using your telephone. Previous no, days we were using your telephone. All the maintenance, we everything now have charge from the mobile. surgeon charge. What do we extra? No, so we see, don't yes. use anything extra. No, only thing, otherwise we are ready. We are ready to be there. And I understand it is my responsibility. Do you agree to, that but every but and one thing more I can tell you. I go to one sec. One sec. What? One, one more. <laughs> one, 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 I, 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 sir, I can tell you, I go to see the patient in the wards also on day two and day three. Correct. Absolutely. And we should but take care of the basic needs of the anesthetic also. Let me, let me but he is running at everywhere. At in our setup, we don't pay the anesthetist. Okay. 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 And will collect the charges directly from the patient, or will charge the uh, hospital for the same. So, does that satisfy you? No, but there is one more news. One more news. In our area, these people were keeping their own meeting. See, but they were, they were not calling us. Okay, okay, okay. They were not I, calling I, I, us. I, I think. Uh, let's see, I think but let us that, see. Uh, enough that. Another, another important thing is, another important thing. Slide up on a bicycle. Yeah, maybe I'll give Yeah. So, do you believe in solo practice or a group practice? If you group, you can do it. Solo anesthetist. You know, he doesn't have time to eat. He has to keep a driver, Iran. He has to keep a driver because he has to rush. He is running. Ha, he is rushing. He is running. And many times he is vulnerable to accident. He is running on highway. On our call, he is asking in the middle of the night, Suche, PPH, are, oh, I, 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 inversion. Are, not giving assistance, then what? <laughs> that is your duty. You have to manage. <laughs> you have to manage for the assistant. Yes. This problem will be solved within a couple of years. Yeah. Yes. So many other cities are in the pipeline. Okay, so now come to the group practice. Yes. Exactly. Are you willing for the group practice? Yes. Say. Yes. yes. Honestly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. Definitely. For so better outcome, yes. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of group practice, Kanti Bhai? Only one this day you will need an assistant. Hello. Distribution of wealth. Today, uh, <laughs> group practice among anesthesia, I know that I know that I know that it was first introduced in Pune. It first there introduced in Hyderabad, sir, by, huh? us, by our team. 1997. 
This was in 80s. It was started in Pune. Pache Pune thi Bombay ma a logo a group banana ba. Ane that has worked. Even Ujjayarthi na upsari ma ay baje. Mari saathe mara kali kam karta hai reya. Chhu Goil ma to mari saathe Bharat Goil a to Rotary ma to mari saathe Dipti a thi. To Parsi ma gayo mari saathe Krina. Benefit se. Yes. Sir. Yes. 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 Bija Sajjan ne ho ni thai ki ke aa point. Bhai umu ta ne aa priyank mokli aa pucho. Whosoever is free. Even at my nursing home, Krina has gone. Dipti has gone. Now, being a solo anesthetist, every anesthetist has a system to manage the past. No, no, solo anesthetist ma. There are, there is a system, sir. You, you, you will be working at the cost of your health. There is a system, Kanti bhai. There is a system to manage the call. And what preference do you give? Do you give preference to the condition of the patient? Or do you give preference to the prior commitment? No, sir. I have a call. I have a call. I have a call. I have a call. Is it the first come first? Or do you give preference to your preferred surgeon where you are going on the first call? Or I don't give, I don't read it. I don't read it, last one. Okay, okay. Sir, what, uh, what sir, is your schedule? That is, that is to be decided by the group, that uh, senior NSTDs and junior NSTDs. I would like to know how you decide the call. <laughs> that, that will be a secret and we will you, decide you, with you, the, you, our you, fellow you are, colleagues. You are attached to a particular hospital. Sir, so, uh, I will decide on my commitment if it is a routine call from the next service. Okay. Is there any other system? Other? Any other system? We would like do, to know do, your system. Do you, do you have, do you know people who will think that uh, this particular surgery is going to pay, pay me 1000 rupees. Ophthalmology. If I go to the other surgery, it's going to pay me 6000 rupees. Our common friend, ophthalmology. Uh, <laughs> 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 So it should be according to the preferred patient's condition. So Dr. Sunil sir, what you want to... No, let, let's not be too individual. Yes, let's... Yes. Yeah. So uh, I feel that we should all follow his principles. Now, there are two or three OTs and two or three OTs are running at the same time. Should one anesthetist run two OTs at the same time, say spinal in one side and general in uh, the other side. Say, one say is to one. To there is no debate, there is no discussion. In the second OT. One premises or even I have seen at two premises. One premises. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I think everybody is saying no, but open your heart. Open your heart and tell me whether you have been doing this or not. Please. One is to one. Frankly. One is to one. One patient, one anesthetist. But the end of the surgery, when there is a closer patient stable, we can give spinal or even in a second OT. In second OT. In the same premises. Now, now, you said very rightly the end of surgery. When does the surgery end? <laughs> when the patient shifted to ICU by, or HD. By God's or grace, we have something like tab block now. So the, even after the end of the surgery, you are required to give a tab block. Tab block. No, but in same, same premises in second OT. No, unless and until you have your assistant. There. See, the thing or is, the junior uh, peers okay. are there. Let's see, all these work. things will come to 
the scrutiny only if something unforeseen reason, if this patient, something happens to this patient and you are not found and you have been busy elsewhere, you are culpable. Yes. So, the duty of the anesthetist ends once the patient is shifted from the theatre to the recovery room, handed over effectively and you come back, your case is over. Then you can start next case. Yes. And that is what Satya. is uh, the standard practice. Satya. And Satya. I think we should abide by this. Doesn't matter because even if the emergency is there in section, 60% of optics is emergency. But of the 60% of emergency section, only 8% are category 1 is there in section. Remaining 52% are category 2 and category 3, you have got 4 to 6 hours of window. So, if I have to triage my patient, like even like we, uh, as an anesthetist in the duty, we are 24 into 7, but there will be, there, there have been instances where at around 10 p.m. in the night, there will be three cesarean sections. Three images, or ekko bulo. See, it is very easy to say or ekko bulo. On call, uh, if we have one person on duty, one more person, so one more person is going to take half an hour. You triage the patient. So we have a system of triaging. Okay, this is the most emergent of the three. Take up that case first. And sir, sorry, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. so triaging is important and prioritizing is important. Suppose if there are two category ones there in section, then definitely yes, one more person is going to come. But you have to remember that that one more person is going to take at least whatever extra is that time to come. So by then, the patient is shifted, stabilized, and PAC is done by the colleague who is there on duty. So it is basically management of personnel man and this believe me these things happen because of poor communication these three emergencies suddenly cannot happen all at a time probably one one instance a year but if you are a good obstetrician or anesthetist on ground in the labor room you know something is going wrong with some patient and you can proactively tap and appropriately intervene so out of i would say uh, 30 years of my practice Nothing happens all of a sudden. Ah, we have been missing that physiological sign that the patient has been telling us last 30 minutes, last one hour. And when, so once we fail to recognize, when the, only when the patient has arrested, then we realize that it, it has happened all of a sudden. But we, we, uh, we overlook the subtle tachypnea, subtle tachycardia, subtle change in dynamics, subtle confusion, all those things are overlooked. So what I mean is, triagic is important, one is to one ratio is important, and uh, that safety is very important yeah. because safety current really current important. medical legal scenario, I don't think we need to take that risk of uh, starting one more case. Another thing. I think we should uh, refrain from doing those things. Satin, uh, in obstetrics, cesarean section is the most commonly done major surgery, and there are categories of cesarean according to the risk categories. Uh, please read out. What are the categories? Uh, in the first category one, there is an immediate threat to the life of the mother or the baby. In the category two, there are the problems affecting the health of the mother and the baby and they are not immediately life-threatening. And category three, the baby needs to be born early but there is no immediate risk to the mother or baby. And category four, plan elective surgery after 39 weeks of gestation at a time, suitable to the mother and the maternity team. Yes. So after this, what should be the anesthesia for every category. Vagera, sir. See, first of the pre anesthetic checkup is uh, required it, each and every patient. Nowadays, in each and every patient, we have to see the patient prior, it 32 weeks, whatever we have decided. So, just go one slide. Yeah, that immediate threat to life of the mother. So, depending upon the patient's condition, we can give spinal or GA that depend upon the patient's condition. Category one. GA or spinal? Immediate threat to the life of the mother or baby. In that case, GA is preferred. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll defy, I beg to defer. Uh, see, GA or regional, again, I presented our audit in Ganga last year. I don't know whether Jagriti can recall. Uh, uh, redefining the decision to deliver interval. So we have been taught that decision delivery interval, once the uh, sir decides that this patient is category 1, 30 minutes we have to give and deliver. But when we did the, our own audit and if we look at the audit of CESDI report, confidential inquiries into still uh, stillbirth deaths and infancy, the report says that majority of the time that 30 minutes was not honored. 
and that 30 minutes was not honored because of poor communication among the team member. And unforeseen reasons, suppose let us say it's a pathological CTG, sinusoidal pattern, risk to the baby, and she is a BM of 50 patient, BM of 50 with malampati grade 4 and not extended head. I will be scared. I, I won't give GA. I will try for regional only because risk, mother's life is important at that moment of time. So risk categorization is very, very important. Uh, and in fact, we have our hospital, we follow category 1A, category 1B. Uh, that is our own classification. In fact, it's in the process of publication that we have recommended. Category 1A is, yes, rupture, <coughs> unstable patient, uh, unstable hemodynamics. Prolapse. You have to put a, a cord prolapse, non-pulsating cord prolapse. Uh, if it is a pulsating cord pulsating prolapse, cord prolapse, you can always pull the, pull, keep the patient left lateral, push the scalp, I mean, uh, sc uh, scalp from uh, upper vaginally, and you can always give a regional, even in cord prolapse cases. But yes, you need to keep all these things in mind, and that is where I said, uh, you need to know more of obstetrics and obstetric medicine to look into this nitty gritty. So these are the obstetric emergencies uh, which we come across and hemorrhage list at the top, other shocks we have discussed. I think Mike so Mike. many things we have discussed uh, trauma. today, trauma. but Mike. trauma. Mike. Mike. Dr. Kanchan is here and we had a case of rupture uterus, Dr. Janakbhai here, five months pregnancy and rupture uterus. We did sonography, we did emergency laparotomy. You are an anesthetist, what else would you suggest? Because as an obstetrician, we will look here, at the most we can put stat over here, nothing more. Would you suggest something in a case of trauma? Polytrauma. Ah, polytrauma. polytrauma. See, we have to follow the trauma protocol. Yeah. Uh, ABC approach, more importantly, uh, brain injury, head injury, cervical spine injury are the most, and the tamponade, tension pneumothorax. So primary yeah. survey, secondary survey, and uh, at some point of time, tertiary survey also is important. Unless until put otherwise, always think that this patient has cervical spine injury, uh, and then manage accordingly. And then uh, you have to do... So uh, in our hospital, a, suppose patient falls down, yeah. there is a possibility of trauma. Trauma. If x-ray is contraindicated, then yeah. there is a sonographic probe, you can easily poop the probe on the thorax and see the, if any pneumothorax is there or not, or hemothorax is not. Rule out this, particularly in Apache patient. See, uh, uh, in a case of trauma, don't bother about risk of radiation. If the mother needs CT brain, CT spine, CT chest, including CT abdomen, uh, do it. If, it is a, if there is an indication, just because of the risk of if you look at the risk of uh, uh, radiation exposure to uh, from by CT scan, it's 0 0.03, 0 0.003 millirad, which is very very less actually. X-ray is not a, you can take almost about 35 to 40 X-rays in a mother without affecting the baby. Yes, we need to take care of uh, lung protection and I mean uh, the put a lead shield on the tummy and uh, minimize radiation. But just for the want of or, or notional risk of radiation risk to the mother. I don't want to do CT scan chest, even though it is indicated, that is wrong. Because many a times, you may have multiple hemothorax, pneumothorax, and in fact, retroperitoneal hematomas in polytrauma case may not be diagnosed even with a red ultrasound. And CT scan is the, the diagnostic tool. So you just have to uh, have a follow ATRS protocol so, no. in trauma. Sometimes, sometimes we come across some situations. We, I, have, I have been scrubbed, I am waiting for the patient being anesthetized. Uh, anesthetist is trying to give anesthesia, he is trying to intubate. Now, he is not able to intubate. Now, what are your options? Because this, here we are silent observers. Yeah. In the morning also, we have seen that if that, in, mostly parturient are difficult intubation. So, SGD, we can easily put the SGD. And uh, one more suggestion, if you are doing routinely, you are conducting <coughs> your uh, gynec cases, just teach your staff to insert the SGD, easily available IGEL, to each and every staff. So everyone is accustomed with this IGEL and all these things. So they will thought in immediately, sir, IGEL nako. Just they will give IGEL, they will guide you if you are blocked. So don't try to see the larynx and try to intubate the patient. Just use IGEL. 
After that, there, is, there are so many options, surgical intubation. And that sir said that each and every hospital must have video laryngoscope. Nowadays, it costs only 40 to 50,000 rupees. So, this facility is also there. So, you can, even you can intubate, is you can help. It is possible that you can't intubate. Sir, and intub intubation, yeah, there are intubation so many is not required, when the ventilation is required. When oh. You can ventilate with the ombu bag or circuit. Ventilation, circuit. will you be okay. able to maintain yeah. 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 That CICO, CICO situation is there. We can't ventilate, can't intubate. Yes. Then there are surgical intervention also. We Each and every NSA is nowadays uh, uh, well okay. equipped okay. with the surgical intervention. Spinal anesthesia has been given, tried. You are not able to achieve the good CSF flow. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, uh, before okay. you go to spinal, uh, what about failed airway? What I recommend and what I do is, in a solo practice, nursing home practice, uh, induction delivery time, you don't have to be bothered, you don't have to be perturbed, number one. So, I will ask surgeon to scrub only once my tube is in. Because, because we, we know, as a trained personnel, they may be able to help us better way rather than a nurse. Of course, you have a trained nurse, nothing like it. Uh, so, the surgeon should go for scrubbing once the tube is in situ, I mean in trachea and you have an entitled carbon dioxide uh, and then yes you can scrub. Uh, because many a times the practice of painting the patient, draping the patient, then you induce the patient uh, is, is, uh, is incorrect actually. Uh, because you are under that uh, sort of, uh, uh, I would say anxious, more anxious in case if something happens and the surgeon is already gloved and you are hesitant to ask for his help because he already is scrubbed and gloved. So, the surgeon should scrub only once the tube is in, especially if it is a uh, general anesthetic. And if it is failed to intubate, patients do not die because of failed intubation. Patients die because of failure to oxygenate. So each one of us have an algorithm protocol of uh, failed airway. You have to announce the drill and you need to have a SGD and different other, other devices uh, which are available uh, to manage the protocol. But ensure that if you are able to Continue ventilation with supraglottic airway device. And you have an option now. Now you open up the channel. You can, should I wake up the patient or should I continue surgery? And if you're able to ventilate well, continue surgery, deliver the baby, and uh, you manage with the supraglottic airway device, the surgery. Sir, what about high spinal? Yeah. So coming to, you're, you're talking about failed CSF. Oh, failed, 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 failed spinal. Uh -huh. High spinal. How will you recognize? <laughs> See, again, how many, I will ask one question to the audience. How many of you use routinely nasal capnometry during spinal anesthesia? Nasal? Nasal? Nasal capnometry. Or how many, how many, how many of you use capnometry? How many, how many of you have ETCO2? Spinal, spinal. See, what happens is, uh, I must tell you that it is always better that we have a protocol wherein even if the patient is under spinal anesthesia, we put nasal capnometry along with oxygen. Because we know, because when the patient is draped and covered, you cannot monitor the chest rise and chest fall. And uh, you, you keep, keep talking to the patient, yes, keep talking to the patient. But chest rise and fall and other things may not be uh, sometimes visible. So if you have a capnometer, you can keep seeing the uh, CO2 level, CO2 level in, and the patient's breathing. And uh, ah, that, that is uh, number one. Number two is as soon as I give spinal, I put a wedge, give oxygen, keep talking to the patient, Dr. Jagrit said, engage in the conversation and assess the level. Once I feel that level has come to D4, D5 level, then I ask nurse to insert Foley's catheter and drape the patient. Many a times we put Foley's under without anesthesia, which is painful. Why do you want to have those things? So, as I said, uh, you don't have to bother about the few minutes of uh, delay in delivering the child. So, once the mother is uh, allowing the nurse to put Foley's catheter without any grimace, that means your level is coming. And second thing is, what I do is I always make a subjective assessment rather than objective assessment. I mean objective rather than subjective assessment. Uh, object in the sense, you assess the level yourself. So first thing is assessment of level of adequate block is very important before the patient is draped. And assessment should be made from the time, thank you, sir. time of Agarji. the areas which are blocked first. And <coughs> then generally we put the needle cap and then come from below and above and then you check the level. Uh, and do not start assessing immediately after spinal. 
because your anxiety is transferred to the patient and subsequently even that perception of pressure or pain uh, which is which uh, they feel because the block has still not come it's in the process and they perceive it as pain and then subsequently even if subsequent if the patient block is successful but some pressure or if the exterior is the uterus it is perceived as pain that noxious human is already registered so assessment of block should be done after three to four minutes that is and that you know when they put the four is you know and once they put the four is they drape the patient it takes about three four minutes and you know your block has come and the block still can go up and become a high spinal and so how do you rapidly detect high spinal anybody rapid way of detecting high spinal phonation, phonation is one hand grip hand grip ask the patient to uh, grip your finger if the patient gripping the finger and talking the phonation is still good she is able to cough that means phrenics are not involved and block is at least d1 and d2 below and if there is bradycardia you can give atropin but suppose if the phonation is uh, becoming whispering noise she is not able to this thing then do not wait for giving atropin give adrenaline because delay in giving adrenaline is the cause of maternal death with high spinals and total spinals so give adrenaline early uh, load one ml <coughs> of adrenaline make it 10 ml give one or two cc intravenous push and uh, give 100 percent oxygen with brain circuit if necessary intubate the patient but importantly high spinals total spinals use adrenaline early 0.6 milligrams of atropine may not work you may have to give 1 milligram or 1.2 milligrams of atropine the total vagolytic dose but again that takes little longer time and by then it can uh, be a little late and i would like to quote barbara morgan uh, she has analyzed all the maternal deaths that have happened because of high spinals very rare the high spinals as i said anesthetic as a cause of mental death is the last amongst all the causes fortunately uh, but whenever it happens the commonest culprit was failed intubation and high spinals and total spinals in high spinals when they have done the audit they realize that the delay in administration of atropine i mean adrenaline I, it was used as a last resort not as a first resort so uh, uh, that, that is the, that you have to remember that use adrenaline early effectively so phonation hand grip and if both are not there just give adrenaline so anesthetic is a helping hand for neonatologist also keep adrenaline diluted ready with your trolley and one more thing if patient is uh, high spinal so he may she may be more anxious as the expiratory and inspiratory muscles are usually paralyzed but diaphragm is not paralyzed at that time so many anxious patient is not able to speak she will always complain breathing problem breathing problem just gives sedate her and give supplement as oxygen nothing no need to give g convert to ga uh, i would refrain from you just just keep verbal anxious where verbal sedation verbal sedation and uh, ben circuit yeah and I put brain circuit rather than Hudson's mask. Any, 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 anything, anybody? Huh? HFNO, CPAP. Yeah, HFNO also is good. But see, I put brain circuit because I know the tidal volume. Suppose if I put uh, Hudson's mask, I don't know how much she is breathing, how much she is getting. So if I put brain circuit with a tight seal, at least I don't say I will hold the mask tightly, but I know how much tidal volume she is uh, breathing. And I have an idea. So, brain circuit and verbal uh, verbal sedation till the baby is out, and then uh, words of reassurance. Most of the time, it takes. Is it an aesthetist? Pound tak tak kan. So, is it an aesthetist? Have you ever faced situation where you have to give some instruction to the surgeon? Iske bhai tu koi ne bola hile. तारो मेड नहीं पड़े कतो यू स्टॉप द सर्जरी यू हैव टू चेंज द कोर्स ऑफ सर्जरी और यू शुड ट्रांसफर दिस पेशेंट बिकॉज वंस इट हैपन टू बी देयर वाज नो एनेस्थेटिस्ट आई वाज वर्किंग इन सिविल हॉस्पिटल नाउ सॉरी एंड आई वाज एनेस्थेटिस्ट एंड दे ऑपरेटेड अ केस ऑफ प्रोस्टेट एंड देयर वाज अ हेवी ब्लीडिंग सो अगेन दे टुक दैट पेशेंट टू ओटी एंड दे वांटेड टू ओपन इट एंड आई सेड नो स्पाइनल नो 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 I won't give spinal, so they insisted me for spinal. Okay, you will. I we are sure that you will be able to manage. Uh, I was not confident, but they were more confident than me. So they start. <laughs> they started operating again. At three times, I told them, "Okay, away, sir, you have to close. 
આ નથી અલ્ટિમેટલી આઈ સે કે હવે તમે કંઈ જ ના કરો તો કેમ મેં કહ્યું પેશન્ટ ઇઝ ડે સો વોટ આર યુઆર એક્સપિરિયન્સ ઇઝ મોસ્ટલી એઝ અ સર્જન સર્જન નોઝ હિઝ કેપેસિટી એન્ડ હિઝ પેશન્ટ હી નોઝ ધ પેશન્ટ ઓન ધ ટેબલ તો એટ ડેટ ટાઈમ ઇટ ઇઝ વેરી ડિફિકલ્ટ ટુ કોલ ફોર ધ હેલ્પ બટ સર યુ એઝ અ સર્જન યુ નો ધ ડેટ ડેટ ધીસ ડિઝીઝ ઓર ધીસ ઇઝ એન્ડોમેટ્રિસિસ ઓર ધીઝ લાઈક દેટ યુ વેલ રેડ ધ પેશન્ટ એન્ડ હિઝ કન્ડિશન સો યુ એઝ્યુમ દેટ ધીસ વિલ બી ડિફિકલ્ટ and this is not my my limitation so you call for the help at in so advance surgeon will but, tell you but surgeon will tell you or you will tell surgeon ke na tara bhi nahi mere pade even many older surgeons <laughs> or any surgeons run the surgery that is a different thing but mostly we can usually for the better pain of patient we can do whatever this has happened patient pain well. I have really been called I mean, we, can many, many. Only, we can suggest at the earliest if uh, the you, uh, respect surgeon is done. blocked mentally blocked maybe if yes, surgeon will not suggest you will suggest may we call someone else see <laughs> it has happened both the sides due respect and regards we have taken liberty to call one more surgeon without the notice of the performing surgeon because we feel <laughs> that uh, <laughs> unable to take decision and same thing has happened from our side also like when we are blank when there is a complication we are blank immediately they call one more anesthetician they are there by the side and two bends were better than one brain there is nothing we should don't feel bad uh, when and you should it's not a sign of <laughs> patient safety is uh, more important ha huh. breaking of okay. bad news that's the worst possible thing who will do it who will do it <laughs> and how will he do it you are coming out from the ot sahib you have done pre anesthesia check up they may know they may not recognize you will you send surgeon to go and tell will you tell staff See, to go and tell breaking 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 the bad news there is a protocol first and foremost is uh, allow the attendants immediate attendants of the family to sit in a room which is little silent and see that uh, they are already the nurse or somebody takes them makes them offers them a seat and gives them some water and other things and once they are seated because many times i see counseling by breaking the bad news standing in the corridor in the labor room door this thing it doesn't let them because sometimes <coughs> you bombard them with so many medical jargons and technical terms they may not register half the things uh, so making the, them sit take a deep breath and then start narrating all the things uh, from the this is what the patient came with this is what he is uh, so and so he is so and so you introduce your team members very very important see that everything what you discuss is being documented uh, because that is also a medico legal document and if you have audio video uh, facility see that it is captured uh, it is captured and uh, yes unforeseen reasons these things happen and you can always give anecdote that uh, not always uh, some some malaysian airlines they do uh, vanish within 48 hours two airlines have vanished Uh, uh into the ocean uh, those things can happen but people have still boarding the flight because impeccable safety record and other things so you can always give those examples and anecdotes and then start breaking the bad news and importantly in the case of maternal death always 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 encourage them for peri- post mortem and if they refuse take their signature because by encouraging post mortem first and foremost you are absolving yourself that yes there is nothing from my side it's something which has happened you know and it was just a coincident uh, that this thing has happened at this time in this setup or in this server and with these these are the hands that the, but once you encourage them to take go for post mortem they also feel that yes something must be wrong with the patient which my invariably most of the time it is uh, uh, some unknown uh, occult uh, factor because i have seen uh, i was telling in the morning so many times unforeseen reason you see this uh, hematomas in the liver sickle cell crisis and uh, uh, cystic uh, cystic cirrhosis of the brain and uh, intracranial uh, space occupying lesion i have seen i got a series of uh, uh, neurovascular emergencies uh, which were undetected normal healthy parturients after giving epidural they become symptomatic and in initially epidural was blamed but we knew that epidural will not cause uh, uh, this features seizures uh, uh, it's not lost the local toxicity 
and we evaluated we found large intracranial space. So, but incidentally, had this patient ended up for caesarean section, would have given spinal, she would have ended up with a coning, and patient would have been dead, and anesthetic would have been attributed, contributed. So, it is impossible, it is difficult to kill a patient under anesthesia. It is easy to kill a patient under anesthesia. Both the things I, I would say. So, you need to be a good clinician, and uh, <coughs> you have to have a good differentials, good documentation, and importantly, when it's breaking the bad news, each one of you should be on the same page first, including the OT staff. Otherwise, the nurse slowly, this attendants will ask the same question to the OT technician, anesthesia technician, the nurse, the surgeon, and if there is this one different version from somewhere, then they'll catch on, latch on that, and then uh, it becomes a point of controversy. So. Uh, breaking the boy, uh, bad news, bereavement counselling is very important and importantly, taking care of your colleague. Uh, it can be obstetrician, it can be an it can be a neonatologist, so that you all are a team member and you share the burden, you share the joy, you share the uh, sorrow also. Very so, important. with this discussion, we are going to end this session. Uh, we have not asked one question to our anesthetist. Do you expect something from us? In one line. Three anesthetists are there. Please tell us in one line. Everyone. Sahib, tamhe kai keva mago We have, Prince, we have expected a lot of things from Now don't expect anything more. <laughs> At least tell them, what do you expect? What do you expect from us? Yeah. I think best avoided. Should we call the relatives into the operation theatre? Should we call the relatives in the operation theatre? Might it uh, make them see that rupture or something as anything? So that we can uh, make them uh, explain or understand pictorically because uh, they won't understand. Some people will not understand. Many times what happens is, uh, it is a good practice when the patient is very critical. <coughs> uh, you call them inside, you show them the vitals, at least they see some saturation and some at least 100% they are saying, which number they will show them. That they will vividly remember and they see the scenario. Uh, because many times in laparoscopic surgeries, we see our surgeons calling them, these are all the additions that we need to do. Uh, like uh, oophorectomies or especially when you don't take consent for oophorectomy and then patient uses oophorectomy on table. Uh, of course, uh, 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 it's a whole controversy, I don't want to go into it, but attendants, they do come inside, they are called inside and that's a good practice. But in but the process, the don't delay or resuscitation effort should not be uh, halted, that should go on. We expect in the patient's benefit, Elderly primary, artificial reproduction, this uh, IVF patients, twins patients, they are the very high risk patients. In that patients, apart from blood investigation, we need at least ECG and ECHO if there, it is very I, good. I think they, they should be worked up equally it, as a major case. Major case and, one, and that, and that also, patient should be shown to your anesthetist. OT, OT setup should be high end. High end, not, oh, only this, boys, not in a small nursing home, these are the patients, you directly post. <laughs> there are lots of expectations, we should keep one another session for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but. Every now and then I, I, there I is a death in a IVF <laughs> setup in OPU. Chintan I bhai. think that is a very bad See, thing. Dr. I, I think that should not happen. <laughs> one thing, one thing, one thing which I want to emphasize is. No, no. I, yes, I, I agree. I, I, you, agree. I agree to that. See, yes. I'll tell you one thing. At least sell. Normal no. ECG, no, no, normal no. echo does not mean that patient is normal. Yes, yes, yes. So don't be fooled if ECG echo is normal. Uh, and your clinical judgment is very important uh, because we have had several cases where echo is normal but patient still end up with problem. Because most of, most of the time, the echoes done in the peripheries are done by diploma in uh, technician or echocardiographers who are not cardiologists and they may not give the true recordings. 
uh, and you may be misguided by that false echo. So, your clinical assessment is very important. In fact, when I see that my clinical findings are not correlating with echo, I call the cardiologist, he goes for repeat echo and the findings are different. So, just a mere normal echo and normal ECG don't be that everything is hunky-dory. You have to be a good clinician. Our ST moderator has asked us, what is your demand in one line? Ah. Yes. So, on behalf of all, I will say what we want is only a good anesthesia machine, a good OT setup with plenty of supply of oxygen. And good surgeon? <laughs> <laughs> that, that we Hello. can't change and we can't demand. Before, uh, before we conclude this session, uh, I am having three questions to the Panya, sir. Uh, first question, up to how limit uh, you should avoid giving atropine? Suppose the spinal has been given, up to what limit you have to wait? Second question, suppose patient after giving spinal suddenly become hypotensive, up to what limit? Like 60. Now the pressure is up, before starting it comes to 60. So whether you give drug, drug of choice is mephentine or phenylephrine. The thing is, our concept of management is do not treat hypotension, prevent hypotension. So proactively you add vasopressors in the colloid fluid that you are giving and you can always give 50 micrograms to 75 micrograms of phenylephrine proactively before you give spinal so that you can prevent hypotension. I don't want hypotension to occur. There should be zero incidence of hypotension. But Despite that <coughs> access, patient has developed hypotension. Uh, basically, if you see the monitor, the initial sign of blood pressure will, uh, there will be initial tachycardia before the blood pressure falls. So the moment the baseline pulse rate increases, I give another 50 max of phenylephrine uh, slowly, slow bolus, uh, because hypotension is going to occur in next minute. Because if you see NIBP, it takes minimum one minute to give one reading. Uh, and even if you are voting every two to three minutes, uh, by the time you deflate, cup deflates, deinflates, it takes some time. So what you see 110 now is actually 90, maybe 90. So proactively you treat hypotension. And phenylephrine is the drug of choice. So if the patient has hypotension with tachycardia, the drug of choice is phenylephrine. If there is hypotension with bradycardia, the drug of choice is ephedrine. And I don't wait till the blood pressure falls to 80 or 90. Always, if the systolic blood pressure is 110, 70, I try to maintain the same pressure. I don't want even 10 to 15 millimeters to drop in the pressure before delivery. Atropine, I give only if the pulse rate goes below 60. But majority of the time, by the time the blood pressure starts falling, you give phenylephrine, it, it causes tachycardia also. The third thing is uh, what I observe, maybe you, maybe all obstetrician may be observing after COVID, especially after COVID, so many patients, uh, full-term labor, going for the caesarean section, after three, patient is absolutely fine, normal tensive, all parameters are going well, after three to four hours, I don't know, suddenly the saturation level is coming down. Uh, there is no etiology factor, there is no other causative agent, like patient is absolutely fine. But the patient will complain, I am having a little bit dyspnea, uh, like breathlessness and all. We will check the, because we will monitor the patient till at least 8 to 9 hours. Especially after 3 to 4 hours, saturation is, go, saturation is going down, 80, 85. Once you give some injection derifiline or some nebulizers, some uh, like uh, Lessix or uh, this uh, diet or whatever, the, again after like few hours, patient is coming back normal. I don't know, I have seen this uh, only after COVID. Huh? This is very common now. Uh, so, any factors? Sir? The thing is, uh, wherever the patient desaturates, you do a thorough evaluation. Is it pulmonary cause? Is it cardiac cause? Is it septic cause? Whatever the baby the cause. No, so, so, I'll tell you, I'll come to that. Uh, we have seen a 4% increase in risk of pulmonary embolism following COVID. 4% or 4 times increase like our surgical ICU patients, the incidence of venous thromboembolism, especially sub-segmental thromboembolism, thromb small segment uh, embolism, not a massive embolism, uh, quite uh, common. So probably if the patient has slightest risk factors like uh, BMF more than 30 and uh, uh, in, uh, uh, during section during, done during labor or emergency, put them on heparin. 
after 12 hours after surgery, or six to eight hours after surgery, but at least for three to five days. That is important. So if the patient, some of them, they desaturate transiently and give nebulization and this thing, probably you need to look into the whole gamut. Is it, uh, what led to that? Uh, because if it is a pulmonary embolism, it, it, it will not resolve within a few minutes. And if it is just momentary fluid overload pulmonary edema, then probably it is. But, uh, so we just have to, otherwise it could be, we just have to look at the, the whole the gamut, whole gamut. So, Dr. Kantibai, would you like to give only one line message? Uh, Satyan, uh, in the OT, anesthetists will give some fluids. Not keeping account of what she has registered in labor room. Kanimar patient has registered three pints in the labor room. Here is going to give two, three pints in the OT. So, your question, the patient will have some drop in saturation after three, four hours. Patient is going to be. Yeah. In a, uh, uh, she, she is over infused. We just have to, again, we just have to do a root cause analysis, detail analysis. It could be fluid overload, it could be momentary. Uh, we, we just have to see. Uh, why that thing is happening, but uh, it could be simple sedation also. If it can be simple sedation also, the patient momentarily falling asleep, or suppose if you have the patient is deceived, if the patient is with intrathecal morphine, misoprostol will not cause. May I? May I? May I? Achha, may I intervene? Satyan, may I intervene? We have kept one hour. Specifically for this discussion, yes, sir, that is interaction, ha, interaction and question answer session with audience participation. So, with your kind so permission, think, yeah. we are going to end this panel session. discussion. I, I think, we, please, 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 Dr. Satyan, be seated for two minutes from more. These analysts, and let me tell you, you all are a fantastic audience, very receptive, very, very good. Thank you very much. From Dr. Sajjar and me. Sir, sir, just a minute. Thank you all for this very good discussion, this panel discussion. And uh, I am I sure we have learned a lot from this. Yeah. It is time to <laughs> felicitate our esteemed moderators. I request Dr. Urvi Ben Patel. Is she around? Dr. Urvi Ben Patel to felicitate Dr. Vipul Kapadia, sir. And felicitate our second moderator, Dr. Gajya, sir. Dr. Jagruti Ben Desai requested to come on the stage. to felicitate Dr. Sunil Pandya, sir. Dr. Neelam Patel, is he there? Dr. Neelam Patel. Dr. Neelam Patel. She is not there. Dr. Dwani, Dr. Dwani, please come on the stage. Felicitate Dr. Satyan Kasavala. Dr. Neha Patel, is she there? Dr. Neha Patel. Please felicitate Dr. Vagela. Request Dr. Krina to please come on the stage to felicitate our very own Dr. Kanti Patel, sir. Dr. Kalasri requested to please come on the stage. Dr. Kalasri to felicitate Dr. Achna Patel.
डॉक्टर आकाश प्लीज कम फॉरवर्ड एंड फेलिसिटेट डॉक्टर चिंतन व्यास डॉक्टर हिरेन नायक रिक्वेस्टेड टू कम ऑन द स्टेज इजी अराउंड एंड फेलिसिटेड हिज ओन सर्जन डॉक्टर प्रिंस नुतिक thank you all i think you will do it thank you all now please remember we have a full one hour question and answer session for all those problems that come to our mind and please be seated till very end because we have a important demonstration of automated external defibrillator a life saving gadget available nowadays on airports and railway stations and people when they know that you are a doctor they may ask you to use that machine and if you cannot then it will be a real pity so please be seated till the very end for the demonstration of automatic external defibrillator dai la rajai desai